but let's squeeze in a couple of would you rather questions. They're all filmmaking related. They're very silly. Would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in a scene? Uh, vomit. I I'm, I don't know. They just what they did. They give you. It's like it's like it's fine. You're fine. I feel like I'm more. I'm I'm. I think sneezing. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't. I don't. I don't buy it. You know. I don't think that that was good. I. I I think that that would be a lot harder for me to do. I just need to take more miming classes, I'm realizing more and more as I'm acting. I keep being expected to mime and I'm like, I'm not good at miming. I need to, I need to go back and train some more. Would you rather have to fake drive in a scene or fake wake up? Fake wake up. I don't have a license. I don't know how to drive, <laughs> but I have had to do it. And um, you know, let me know what you think. <laughs> Would you rather spend a night in Hill House or Bly Manor? Bly Manor, Bly Manor. Lots of nice ghosts. I hang out with the little boy and the and the um, the guy, uh, the the um the tall no the tall man's in Hill House. The um the um <laughs> what is he? The plague doctor. He was really he was really cool. You know he was pretty quiet, but. He was a nice presence. I've become convinced that that's the right answer. We were busy uh, debating it before, but I think it's just, you have to pick Bly. Hill House, you're just, you're gonna die. Bly Manor, like, you can be like, okay, I know the Lady of the Lake is here. I just gotta stay out of her way and enjoy some tea and crumpets. I've got eight questions. I roll the dice three times and whatever three questions we land on, that's where we start at least. Number seven, I'm glad we landed on this, is called collection. So last time we spoke, you told me you like to collect things. So what is the most recent thing that you collected that would make someone else say like, what is that? Why do you have that? But it means something special to you. I'm just a hoarder. Like I just like hold on to shit I shouldn't be holding on to. I just like, 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 like the, 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 um, like pamphlets of information from like a rafting trip or something like that. Like I hold on to that because I was like, I need to remember. Next roll here. We got an eight this time. Oh yay, Halloween. Any plans for Halloween? I'd like to dress up. I mean, I get to play dress up as a job, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm always looking for more opportunities. I love costumes and yeah, that's, that's the main thing. I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing beyond that but I'd like to have some fun and definitely celebrate. Do you have your eye on any particular costume this year? No, no. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I, I'm currently obsessed with the movie Malignant. Have you seen that yet? No, I only saw the trailer. Watch that movie and when you hit the beginning of the third act, you'll know what I think your costume should be. Okay, okay, cool. We'll see if I gain the courage to watch it. <laughs> One is more TV, please. If you could guest star on the TV show of your choice, what show would you pick and why? Reservation Dogs right now? If I was just like a gas station attendant who didn't speak, that'd be cool. You know, like, I don't, I, I just like the show. So it'd just be, uh, it'd be amazing to be a part of it in any small way. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to Collider Ladies Night. And I have to say, welcome back to this wonderful guest, Victoria Pedretti. I think this makes you our third returning guest on Ladies Night now. And again and again, I hope. We're gonna start with school here. What is something that you learned while studying acting in college that proved to be invaluable when you started to work? But then on the other hand, what is something that all the studying in the world could never have prepared you for when you hit your first set? Uh, one of my favorite things, I had this teacher, um, Feindel, and she taught us voice, and I did not connect with her. Like, for the first week, I was just like, what? I just, I was, I was frustrated. She turned out to be one of my favorite faculty members, and I, I was one of those people when I'd get a note, I'd just start justifying why I did what I did instead of changing and, like, taking the note. And she was like, Victoria, cut it. Like, just say thank you, implement the note, move on. And that's how I am now. You know, I, I get, get the note. I have the confidence to be like, that doesn't mean what I did was wrong, but I still need to try something new. 
And so I just say thank you and I and I do it. I mean, unless it's like, unless somebody's like, uh, like deeply offensive or something like that, there's a conversation we had, I guess. But I think it's really valuable to just say thank you and take the note. I feel like that's a valuable note in, in any profession out there. Yeah, a note on taking notes. Um, and then the thing that I could never be taught, most of it. <laughs> Especially being on a film set. I think there's a huge learning curve when you first start out. And I've been really lucky to work with a lot of crews that are really patient and have an interest in helping me understand the mechanisms of what are going on and have an interest in answering my questions. All right, let's get into Hell House now. So I'm very curious what expectations that working on that set first set for you, because I was just covering a midnight mass. So I have a whole bunch of like really positive things about the Flana family on my mind right now. So what are some things that Trevor and Mike did for you on the Hill House set that you wish you saw on more sets out there? I mean, that entire crew, a huge amount of that crew were people that had worked with Mike Flanagan and Trevor like in the past. And I think that that was a really special thing to walk into. There was a real, there was already a rapport, you know. Mike really worked a lot to protect the scene work and push for us to have the amount of time we needed to um, capture like the beautiful like work of, you know, Michael Feminari and, um, and, and protect the acting and the, and the scenes. Um, and, and so many people told me on that set, you know, stuff doesn't work like this. You're really being spoiled. And that's true. It was, it was really an environment that was conducive to real um, creativity. And I'm forever grateful. Fuck, <gasps> fuck. I'm a little emotional lady. No, I'm good. I'm not actually crying, but I definitely got a little choked up there. It's really, it was a really special way to start off my career. Speaking of that, actually, so I'm wondering what kind of relationship you had with some of the cast there, because you jump on that set, it's your first big project, and all of a sudden you're surrounded by people who have filmographies a mile long. Uh, Carla Gugino, Elizabeth Reeser, Timothy Hutton, I can go on and on. Is there anything that you saw any of those, I guess, industry veterans do that you put in your back pocket and wanted to do on your next project? Mm, everything Carla Gugino does. She creates a wonderful atmosphere. She really takes on that role of leadership that I think actors don't choose but are kind of put in we do um what for better or for worse control a lot of the tone of the the set some of the time um if an actor is really difficult or 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 even stressed or frustrated like of course those things are normal but like the ability to um, deal with those things with grace, I think really improves the working environment for everybody. And she's just a beacon of grace. <laughs> I feel like the show is becoming the Carlo Gugino appreciation show. The last guest I just had sang her praises. Yeah. And I get it. I mean, it is what it is. Speaking of that last interview, this is a little random. This question was inspired by the latest My Little Pony movie, and I just really like it, so I want to keep asking it. Let's what know. is an example of something that you refuse to try because of the assumptions that you made about it, like a type of role, a, a prep technique, whatever you could think of, but then you tried it for the first time and it made you say, you know, I was wrong about that, and now I'm glad I did it. I mean, just doing horror. I think I thought it was... Like, uh, like, a, like not substantial, you know? And I did a horror show and it was like dealing with a lot of subject matter that's so human and the final product was extremely substantial, I think. You gave me a perfect segue to this next one I wanted to ask because the last time we were, we were talking, uh, you had mentioned that even with how successful Hill House was, it wasn't the type of situation where like, the doors blew open and you got all of these opportunities. So I was wondering if that changed after Bly, if the one-two punch of those two shows and how good they both were basically did open those doors despite the assumptions many people make about the horror genre. I don't know um, exactly if that happens to people. I mean, like, I think there's like maybe a very, very few people that become so 
hypey and trendy and hot that like they're getting all of the offers in the world. I'm not that person. I, I have gotten some really great offers to work on things I'm really excited about, but the bl doors blowing open is not my experience or hasn't been. For what it's worth, I think it should be, but I know I know that it's only, you know, realistic to the tiniest percentage. I think I would find that overwhelming. I think it's it's hard to believe that like everybody thinks you're perfect for their project. You know what I mean? I think there's there's something about even being offered something that makes me insecure. I, I like the process of auditioning because it allows me to present an idea that I have about the role and for somebody to be like, oh yes, that's what we're going for. If you're offered something, nobody's gotten to see you try out the character. So I feel like, I think they could have made a large oversight. I think it's a lot, it's a lot scarier for me to take it on knowing that they didn't get to see what I was gonna, what my ideas were with it first. Totally understand that way of looking at it. All right, before we get into you, I have like a big, broad question. So everyone out there knows that I love asking about the value of a good scene partner. So with anything you've worked on in the past, can you think of an example of a time where you were having trouble accessing a certain part of your character, but because of what your scene partner gave you, you were able to reach that? Yeah, I've, I've, I've felt that so many times. I've really been lucky to work with a lot of uh, really great scene partners. Um, I think I've be I've become more confident as time has gone on. I think Hill House was definitely the role I was the most nervous for because there was that component of well, if I fuck up the first one, who is ever gonna have the thought to hire me again? You know, um, who's but but then there are moments where people just like save your ass. I don't I don't know. I think or hunker down. Yeah, me me and Penn this season had to do a scene where we were in inclement weather and <laughs> just having a partner in that was everything, you know, because everybody else is wearing, you know, fisherman looking outfits. <laughs> so they're, they're not dealing with the, um, the elements in the same way we are. And just being able to like lock into that, uh, that's a very physical, like, uh, I guess, representation of that. Uh, I mean, Jordan Christie is an amazing scene partner. Oliver Jackson Cohen, you know, those scenes in Hill House with both of them, I think were challenging and I really felt supported in all of that. The breakup scene um, with Penn, like I did not expect it to be as emotional last season, you know, when we're sitting there on the chair and he's beneath her being like, um, I'll call you, call me anytime. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like we were really able to take that scene somewhere. Um, yeah. Oh, it's nice to just think about how grateful I am for all these great I've, scene parts. I feel like I could have started with that question and literally our whole interview could have been you rattling off your co-stars. Oh, I would like, love that. Like an exceptional <laughs> group of people you've worked with. Yeah. All right. So what about your collaboration with Penn in particular? What's something about the way you two work together that stayed consistent from season two to season three? And then what's something about what the characters are going through this time around that called for something different? I mean, we're just not connecting as much in general as a couple this season. And that was simultaneously existing with Penn having like a three month old baby when we started, something like that. I don't know exactly how many months old <laughs> his baby was, but um, so like there, we, the last season we were able to, also a pandemic, like before that we were just able to interact more outside of set and talk about it, things more. And um, just a product of everything, we just spent less time together. And that, that kind of suited how our relationship developed as characters. Here's two specific beats now that I want you to compare. What is, what's going through Love's mind and, and what is your approach to the moment when she decides to kill Natalie versus when she hits Theo? Because both are examples of her kind of being impulsive and reactionary, but they also do feel quite different and nuanced. So different. I think killing Natalie, um does not feel good. I do not think that she gets pleasure out of um, 
killing people. I think she gets pleasure out of like hurting Gil, probably. Um, but yeah, the uh, the act of killing Natalie is there's a level of you know vengeance to it and like a level of anger and like and and when she goes after Theo, that's just desperation. She feels she has no other option. She's devastated that it's come to this. She, I think she really sees him as this like beautiful young, you know, bleeding heart. It, it, she, it reminds her of her brother a bit and also of Joe in ways. So, so different, so, so different. I guess this one is kind of like the million dollar question. Is, is love definitely dead? Is she gone for good? <laughs> Question for the writers, but um, I'm under the impression she's dead. She seems pretty dead. She seems pretty <laughs> dead, but like when I like a character, I want to find an excuse to bring them back for more. I'm greedy. <laughs> I have to let you go. Huge congratulations on you yet again and your whole filmography. I'm counting down until the next time we get to talk. Thanks, Perry. I'm looking forward to it. 